to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who has no problem with a fully bonded and insured, totally legal entertainment industry employee renegotiating a higher rate after... They retire to the other side of the bead curtain just so long as he gets to keep the perfumed thong. It's Mr. Lauren Baumgarten. Lauren! (laughs) For the life of me, I don't have a clue what that's referring to. Uh, It's referring to the fact that a stripper says it's $30 for a private dance, and then when you get in the room, she says it's $50 for a private dance. And you say, no problem. That's what it's referring to. Uh, okay, okay. I'm still looking forward to finding out what item that refers to. <laughs> Who said it referred to anything? I know it refers to something in the show, but for the no, life it, of me... It will. It will tie in. It, it it will tie in. Staring at the document that we use to do the show? See, here's the, here's the thing. Like, I was going to make this whole joke. I was going to make like, this whole stripper joke about... Um, like once you get on the other side of the bead curtain, you don't have any problem paying for your expansion. But I thought it was just this is a classy show, and that was just like too far. Uh, okay, okay, I see, I see where you're going with that. Um, that is some cerebral shit right there. Yes, yes. I, if there's anything this show is known for, it's for thinking. It's for being cerebral. That's, That's right. right. Uh, how was your holiday, my friend? Welcome back from Turkey Day. Thank you. Uh, my holiday was was great. It was just me at home with the family, taking it easy, playing with Z, not doing too much of anything. So it did was, you make her a, a really tiny turkey? Uh, no, actually, we did not do turkey because my wife's actually not that big a fan. So uh, we did uh, we did homemade chicken pot pie for dinner. Ooh, ooh, that sounds good. It is. It's very very good. And yes, Z did have a little homemade chicken pot pie. Nice. Very nice. Uh, did you do any Black Friday shopping? No, no, I didn't actually. Not one video game this whole weekend. I, I haven't bought a thing. I, I I looked at some of the deals, and honestly, like if if I had come into this, like if I had just spent all year saving money, and I had like maybe like a thousand dollars or something like that, I I could have I could have gotten a couple of things that like I wanted. Like you know, there was some computer stuff that I saw. Like oh, that's yeah, that's a pretty yeah. good deal. I I I'd like to get that. But TVs, there were TVs on sale. Yeah, a I lot just, of TVs. I just got a new TV. Like I know a bunch ago, of four K TVs on sale, and I I got a four K TV. So. Uh, so no, I, I didn't get anything. I don't really need anything, but, uh, I just, you know, like I just looked around a little bit, but there was just nothing that I felt like I really needed. I mean, there's always that, there's always that, uh, that thing where they're, where they're, they're selling you something like, oh, this is such a good deal. And you're like, I have no idea what I would even use a set of drill bits like this for, but God, it's such a good deal. I need it. Like, Done, I'm buying it. Yeah, I mean, like, I've fallen prey to that in the past, and I, I've just kind of learned. It's like, if, if there's something that I'm actively shopping for, and I go into Black Friday, and I see it on sale, then I, I'll go for that. But I'm not going to buy something that I've never even thought about owning just because it's a good deal. I've, those days are behind me. Indeed. I, you know, well, Brent, I did pick up one game. What'd you get? During Black Friday, and I think you're going to be proud of me. Okay. Just Dance 2016. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I picked up one game for Black Friday, yeah. and it was Just Dance 2016. Congratulations. I'm not sure proud is the word. That I'm, <laughs> not exactly what I'm feeling at this moment, but... I thought I thought you might not but be. My wife is you. a My wife is a fan, and I managed to hold her off until the game. It fell to $25, yeah. as opposed to having paid the full retail $60, like I did last year. Let's go ahead and get into the garage, and it's going to be a garage-centric show this week as that's right we've got a bunch of we got a bunch of news stories but we didn't really come across anything that we felt warranted a uh, main discussion topic but we want to talk about all these news stories which is going to take some time so we're probably going to skip the clubhouse topic this week and uh and we'll, we'll pick that up again next week but for right now let's talk about the story that i just can't get away from i have seen this story pop up in my rss reader at least nine times since... Nine times? Like, nine times since it originally... I mean, like, video game blogs, tech blogs, uh, you know, Apple-centric blogs. Yeah, I mean, just, like, you name it. Like, every, like, thing remotely tech-related that I follow came out of the woodwork this week to report that Sony has confirmed that they are officially going to do a PS4 remote play application for Windows... 
and Mac. Of course, uh, Xbox One already has this functionality with Windows, not with Mac, obviously. But Sony is uh, is working on something. This was uh, confirmed by Shuhei Yoshida, who said that, quote, yes, uh, we are indeed working on an official remote play application for PC and Mac, and it will support both Windows and Mac OS X. Um, no more details than that. However, what, <laughs> as, as Engadget points out in the article we're linking to, the, the sort of the thing that's interesting behind this is that there is a, there's a guy, some, some, you know, developer who has been working for like over a year and created a, uh, a, a remote play application for Windows, uh, with the PlayStation 4 and he was, you know, going to charge $10 for it and everything. And Sony basically just came in and knocked over his Lego pile. <laughs> and said, "Yeah, guess what? We're going to do this, and we're going to charge ten dollars." That's right. They're like, "Oh, that's a really nice, uh, that's a really nice Lego thing that you made." <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyway. yeah. No, so I, I have a question for you, Brent. Yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out, and, and I think maybe I don't understand this. Why I care about this? Is, is, is it mean that I'm going to be able to play it on a lower end laptop, like remotely for, when I'm on vacation? As long as you're on vacation in your bathroom, yeah, you're fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which, by the way, is where I tend to vacation. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, because um, the days of perfumed thongs are long behind us now. But uh, the point is that if this if this works like the remote play or the game, I think it's called the game streaming function on uh, on Xbox One and Windows Ten. That's just your, that, that's just your local connection at home. I mean that that's basically you know your LAN or your Wi Fi network. Same, same as like remote play, like on the Vita, like you know the way that you can. Uh, well, that's not exactly remote play, but you know the way that you can. Uh, the way that you can use the Vita to. I guess actually it is remote play. Yeah, yeah. it is. It is remote. Yeah, play. yeah, because you're playing it on the. Yeah. So, but, but but it's only on the same network. You can't do that from outside the house. Yeah, I mean it's not like it's not like you're going to have like your own PlayStation Now game server streaming over the internet from your PlayStation Four at home. It's just it's just within your home and. I guess that's the, so. Then I wonder why I care. Like, what's the use case that really that really is compelling for this? I mean, like, I get the I get the Vita thing because that's like I can't have my PlayStation Four in bed with me, although I'd really like to sometimes. Right, and I have once um, or twice. But you know, I I can't. I don't have the PlayStation Four in the bedroom. It's in the living room, and so I'd like to be able to. I'd like to be able to. You know play some games in bed i can do that on the vita and i guess it's the same thing for this but it's just i, I like i don't know i mean i guess the one the, thing i can think of is my wife wants to watch tv right if you've only I've got, got one tv you got the one television right. somebody wants to watch tv you could like set up your laptop be sitting beside them on the couch playing the playstation 4 on the laptop that would make right, sense I mean, that, that's yeah. yeah okay i mean that, that's that great i just it doesn't i don't i don't think it's as big of a deal yeah as it's maybe being made out. To well, be. maybe maybe not for you and I. Uh, you know, per- perhaps there are some people that that, that have a, a different use case. That- well, and I do. I am in the situation where we have. I have one TV. Right. So that does happen. But I still don't think it has that much value personally. But it is. It is one of those things that now Sony has it, where Xbox is kind of one of the big things they were touting. Yeah. Was this sort of ecosystem where it kind of flows back and forth and now Sony has it. So good well, for them. It is good for them. But here here's the other thing about it, like. To me, there is a there's a bigger story to this, I think, and that is you remember those comments. I can't remember if it was Shuhei or if it was uh, another exec from Sony, like maybe Andrew House or somebody. But I seem to remember earlier this year somebody at Sony making comments to the effect that Sony doesn't see any reason why the PlayStation experience has to be limited to the PlayStation console. And people were speculating about what that might mean. They were talking about remote play for you know PC the way that we're seeing now, but also the idea of PlayStation Now having an application on on like Windows or iOS or something like that. But but the idea that PlayStation or that Sony may be looking at a long term plan where a PlayStation console being in your home is not the most important thing to them so much as you having a PlayStation service that you can get games and play directly on your TV because you've got PlayStation now built into your television, which I do. Um, yeah, and, you know, and things like that, that the, the, the Sony's long-term strategy 
is is not necessarily to to have play the PlayStation experience tied to a console, but they want to be like Netflix and they want the PlayStation experience on every device that's connected to the internet in your home. Which is, is that pl- which is an in, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm all for it if it will allow me to uh, again play play PlayStation games without having to own a PlayStation. Yeah, I, I, it's a fascinating. And I mean, idea. first run ones like you know Uncharted. Yeah, yeah. And that I know sort exactly of thing. what you're saying. Um, so uh, there you go, Brent. Well, we just did the clubhouse <laughs> on, on the first topic <laughs> accidentally, um, but that's okay. All right, so let's move on. Yes. Uh, just how next good, up, Lauren, you've been playing Battlefront on the PC. You yeah. don't you don't have an underpowered PC. You've got a very decent game rig, not the highest yeah. of the high end. No, nine seventy, but uh, but a very a very respectable PC rig. Yep. Is Battlefront an ugly game? Uh, it is far from ugly. It is, and I think so. Interesting week this week. I'm going to talk about Battlefront. Of course, there was a lot of conversation on the website about it, Brent. I don't know if you saw. Um, kind of went back and forth a little bit with one of our listeners, Aaron B., and also maybe yeah. a little bit with Rowan, um, kind of talking about the amount of content in the game. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of reaction, obviously, to Star Wars Battlefront, but I think almost everybody agrees it is one of, if not the best-looking game uh, on this generation yeah. or whatever of all time. What, I mean, it's, it's amazing-looking. It's a very, this, very good-looking title. I'm going to talk a little bit about that conversation, that back-and-forth um, in just a minute, because I do uh, feel like um, maybe I was misunderstood from last week's show. But this video, this is a, a video done by um, uh, Digital Foundry. It, it's called Star Wars Battlefront versus Return of the Jedi Speeder Bike Mashup. And they literally took footage from the game. They color corrected it a little bit uh, to match the, um, the film a little, a little better and, and mashed it up with footage from the actual film of Return of the Jedi to see how well they look together. Uh, and it's incredible, man. It's absolutely incredible. I've watched it two or three times, and I'm still looking for places. There's still places where I can't tell if it's the movie or the game. It's, uh, it's pretty damn close, especially like the POV shots of the bikes going through the trees and everything. Uh, it, it feels like that same sort of flavor, obviously just, not, uh, just, just done much, much better, uh, technically, than they were able to do in 1983 with their one frame per second steady cam walk through the Redwood Forest. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, now it's it's really incredible, and I encourage people to look at it. It's a pretty cool video to watch. And actually, I'm going to defer to talk about that other stuff till I talk about the game yeah. uh, uh, later on and talk about playing it. But it's just a very cool video. Uh, the game looks phenomenally beautiful, and yep. it's fun to watch. It's cool to check out. Did you see? I I, I can't remember. And if we talked about this last week, stop me. But did you see there were screenshots floating around? Somebody had done a oh yeah, the, the realism mod. Yeah, they'd done the realism mod for it, and they yeah. were they were sharing some screenshots that they had taken in the game using that mod. And I mean, like as good as the game looks, I, I, and like you're saying, I mean, with a little color correction, you can basically you can basically intercut the game with live action photography and really and really have a hard time telling the difference. I mean that that's not hyperbole. It's really that and. As good as the game looks, you look at that realism mod and the screenshots from it, and I mean, it's photographs. It looks like photographs that people have taken of stormtroopers lying dead in the sand and that kind of thing. But and he was saying that I mean, like the frame rate's stupid. I mean, it's like two to four frames a second or something like that. I mean, it's, <laughs> yes. it's completely impractical for playing. It's just for taking screenshots. But the thing about that that's crazy is you think about okay, yeah. That realism mod, two to four frames a second now, but you think about... 18 months from now. That's exactly right. You think about 18 months from now, 18 months from then, you think about somebody doing this at the engine level with hardware optimization for NVIDIA or AMD and that kind of thing. I mean, it's really probably not that far away that you could have a game... playable version of that. playable version of that running at 30 plus frames a second. I mean, it's really probably not that far away, and... That's really exciting to me. I, I I want that. I want that day where we where we are playing games that you literally can't distinguish from, uh, you know, from photography. Yeah, we're we're not that far away from that. You're right, Brent. The, but the new frontier is going to be virtual reality and rendering that now in full resolution twice at 
you know, however many hertz and however many frames per second. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's going to be the new frontier for that. But you're right. We're not – I mean, it, it's amazing, and you're, we're probably 18 to 24, 36 months away from being able to run it as an actual game. Speaking of an actual game. Yeah, this is big news. This actually could have been the clubhouse in and of itself. This is a big deal. It just, it just I felt think. good. And, you know, I think uh, this is uh, this is one of the things like I, I didn't know about this. All right. Well, let's not bury the lead. Um, there is a patent that's held by Konami on loading screen mini games, and it's set to expire. It, it, I think it's already it expired. expired. It actually, expired it expired November. Week. Yeah. November 27th. Right. Right. So it's expired as of now. But this patent prevented people from implementing or even developing, according to this this news story, um, loading screen mini games, unless they paid Konami to essentially license the patent. And this is really fascinating because I could remember having conversations, and now admittedly, with varying degrees of success, load screens have become less and less of an issue as games have matured. I mean, there, there's like Metal Gear Solid Five has fucking load screens, you know, I mean... That's not to say that they're completely absent, but in some games, they do manage to be wholly absent. But there was a yep. time when load, sc- when load screens were very, very prevalent, and I could remember having conversations and saying, like, why don't they just have, like, really dinky, like, simple little games and stuff, you know, that you can play, which, which some games have, in fairness. But I was like, why don't more people do this? Like, like why doesn't everybody have, like, a little, a little bit of gameplay or something that you do on the load screen? And... This is why. This is why more people didn't do it, because Konami had this patent that they no longer have. The question, of course, is, does it matter now? Are, you know, we're, we're in a day and age where load screens are, they are as, uh, as least implemented as they ever have been, I would think. So does it matter that, that we can do this? I'm sure that you know, people find creative ways to do it, but there was a time when distracting you on a load screen would have been a really, really valuable thing. And I, I don't know if it's all that valuable now, but it's still very interesting. I actually, I actually do think it is Brent because they. Ha- I mean, there are certainly games that have uh, minimized loading screens, uh, like say Uncharted, yeah. for example, the Uncharted series. Yeah. There still are loading screens at the beginning, mm-hmm. um, and uh, every time you launch the game, you're you're put into loading screens. Right. So, uh, and, and typically, the loading screens at the beginning tend to be a little bit longer when there's no loading screens during the game. Correct. Um, uh, but there are still, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know, I'm making this up, but I would, I bet 80% of games, do you, do you think maybe? I think maybe 70%? They just, maybe they just hide them much, much better these days. I, I mean, I think, I think most, oh, more than 50% of the games still have loading screens frequently. They're not like Uncharted where once you're in, there's no more loading screens at all. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, I don't know. I think this can be valuable. I mean, again, uh, as technology uh, doubles and then doubles again and then doubles again, Loading screens become, you know, and as we actually can, you know, build smaller chips that can have so much more memory, whether, you know, it's RAM or, or memory on the uh, GPU or whatever, um, they will become less prevalent. But I, I think it's going to be, I think we're a ways away. And again, particularly as we start doing things like, you know, rendering 4K video is going to take, you know, require more processing power and RAM, doing things like VR where you have to render the image twice is going to re- require sig- significantly more um, processing power and RAM, and so uh, I, I don't think loading screens are going to go away entirely for for a number of years to come. And I, more than anything, I, I'm just interested just interested to see what people can do with this creatively. Yeah, I mean it's it's been well, they say 20 years they held that patent, something like that. Yeah. Um, so essentially, in modern gaming, nobody's been able to do that without paying for it. Nobody's paying for it, and I'm curious to see if if uh, people start doing it. Little mini games are are possible during the loading screen. So I don't know. I think it's going to be... I, I think loading screens are maybe a little more prevalent than you give them credit for, but um, even if they're yeah, not... I, I'm, I'm probably just, just not thinking of... I'm probably just not thinking of, you know, the examples off the top of my head outside of the game I'm playing right now. Um, imagine... Although, although, that does bring to mind, like, okay, so like a load screen for Metal Gear Solid, it's, you know, like it's loading in and you're playing... Like classic Metal Gear, like 2D, NES, Famicom... I was thinking Fallout Shelter and Fallout. Metal Gear... And like like the like the loading screen game is like it's just like a little it's kind of like like Metal Gear VR missions like it's basically just like a tiny yeah. little obstacle course where you're controlling 2D Snake there's a guard there's like a crate and you've got to get from point A to point B you know during that load screen like you got to sneak around the guard in the in the crate like from one side of the screen to the other something just really simple like that Fallout's another great example you could totally do 
you, you could like do like a callback to like classic old school I- isometric Fallout, Fallout Shelter. Um, yeah, th- that that's interesting. I'm I'm curious. Imagine, I wonder if you could do stuff where it affects it in the game. So imagine like Metal Gear, and oh, in the yeah. loading screen you see the map of your upcoming. Like you see the map, so it could be a whole a- added mini game where you see the map. Right. You, you you aggregate through actions or achievements or whatever certain uh, resources that you can utilize during the loading screen maps. Yeah. And you could place um, wh- whether it's you know movement mines or sensors or something in that map. So once you load in, you've now placed devices. That's a great idea. Or, or you know it could be it could do things like it could like it could unlock marking on the map for you. So like you go into the you go into the level. With all enemies marked, uh, or you know, like a uh, something like, uh, or you get you maybe you get to a mark like three thirty percent of the enemies, and you got to pick from an overhead view which ones you're gonna mark. Or- right, like it'll it'll like it, it gives you like a reticle on the map, and you can like drop that reticle, and it'll just you know like out you know in a radius around that point, it'll mark enemies. But just you know, within that radius, and then outside that, you're on your own. But yeah, I mean, the possibilities yeah, the, are, the are idea endless. Of build, building like a like basically like a bonus or like some sort of buff mechanic around that, or you know, go the other way. Like if you fail the mini game, uh, you know, you can uh, you can you can lose some things. But the idea of of actually having it uh, be relevant to the central game that's a fucking cool idea. And I'm very curious to see. If developers are thinking the same way that we are and play off this to to implement some of these ideas in future games, that'll be or, very, or very cool. I just had another thought. Theoretically, the mini game on the loading screen could somehow tie to the second screen experience. So imagine Fallout Shelter Perfect. existed, Perfect, but you do yeah. something in the mini games that ties into Fallout Shelter. Yeah, it buffs your Fallout Shelter. It you, you know, like it uh, it it you know, it triggers like an unlock for like a character card or a really good weapon or you know, absolutely, kind of or the other way around. You play Fallout Shelter and it triggers something in the mini game in the loading screens. Yeah, yeah, that, and, and the the uh, idea of like designing gameplay experiences that are only intended to last, say, ten to twenty seconds, you know, depending on the, the length of the load, uh, the load screen. The idea of designing gameplay experiences that brief. That you, that in and of itself is interesting. It is. It, it, it's a really interesting exercise in game design. You know, the idea of having having some some fully formed game experience that has a beginning, middle, and end, where you're looking at you're looking at something on screen, and you you have to you have to really instinctively uh, like divine what the game mechanic is. You know what the problem is that you're trying to solve with the game mechanic and then, and then executing it. Like it has to, it has to, you know, work almost instinctually, uh, or they just have to, you know, give you a tutorial (laughs) to walk you through it. But, but the idea of just designing (laughs) like these really, really small gameplay experiences for load screens, that's a, that's a really interesting idea in and of itself. And, you know, what would that look like? And what would the, what would the design principles of it be? Yeah. yeah, I think it's I think it's fascinating, and I think I I, I love like as you said, just the whole idea of having to create ga- a game in that way, and I, th- I I don't know, I just think there's a lot of possibilities. So I'm excited to see if people do something with it. So am I. Let's uh, let's take a break here in the middle of the garage. Oh, thank God. And uh, and we're gonna get a word from our sponsor, which is uh, last week's poll question. <laughs> uh... <laughs> which is why our financial model is broken. <laughs> this is because <laughs> we. <laughs> This is why we, we have no idea what a sponsor actually is. That's right. This is why the business model has never, never quite been as sound as we'd hoped. Uh, Lauren, why don't you, uh, why don't you review last week's poll question and the answers that came from the Outlaw Gamer audience? Absolutely. So last week we were talking about the profit margin on uh, digital games. Specifically, the article was referring to EA, but uh, we were talking about it in general. And Brent's question to you was, "What's your take?" on EA's profit margins on digital versus physical games. And this is how it shook out. Coming in in very last place with only 5% of the votes, you guys said, I found it pretty interesting read vis-a-vis the challenges of games retail. Coming in uh, just slightly above that with 7% of the votes, you said, I'm okay with the price profit thing given how flexible game pricing has become. Those got 5 and 7% respectively and then tied for first place both answers with 44%. You said, no surprises here. We all know publishers like digital because it's more profitable and also chose the answer. How is it okay that EA is lowering costs but charging us the same? Uh, so those were how the answers shook out to last week's poll. Brent, again, a great discussion uh, on the show post. Thank you guys for participating. We greatly, 
greatly appreciate it. Yes, indeed. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, move on to the more b- ridiculousness. The Brent. bottom half of the garage. Yeah, this first story. I, I just got to dive right in here because do it. I, I, this. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to be disrespectful. Uh, no, to the, not, I mean, not on this show, a classy to, show to like the this. creator of, I support people's creative vision and endeavors, and I'm glad people do it, but this one seems a little out there to me. Maybe not. I don't know. And that is a uh, recent announcement that Fez, mm-hmm. the indie game coming from, um, I want to say Phil Lesh and it's not, no, Phil it's Lesh. not Phil Lesh. Uh, it's somebody fish. I can't remember. Phil Fish uh, is getting Which I always, three years. I always think of Gafilka fish. <laughs> Three years after the release of Fez, mm. uh, Fe- they are releasing a hundred dollar physical limited edition of the game. The game, by the way, so the physical edition, uh, the physical limited edition, Brent, excuse me, yep. contains the PC and Mac version of the game physically, uh, as well as a. I don't. It's not really being billed as an art book. It's being called a notebook um, with art directly from Phil Fish, um, as well as the game soundtrack. So it, it, it's an odd choice because, it's, it's again, it's the PC and the Mac version of the game. You can pick them up on Steam at any given point for probably a dollar ninety nine. Yeah, but you don't get like the, the, the red hardcover notebook with the gold uh, foil thing. Which they don't really show you when you go to the store's webpage. You don't really elaborate on what's inside. They talk about it. Um, it's a gold foil inlay, and there's a little bit of a picture with the book slightly ajar, but you can't really see into it, and it's a hundred dollars. There's only a limited amount being made, five hundred of them. For so, my guess is he only needs about fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. This is I, I I don't know, Brent. What did you think of this? I just I mean, I, it's supposedly I, I played the game. I liked it. I didn't love it. I didn't finish it. That, that's me. Um, that's me exactly. I, I mean, many like, many people loved it, but it, it, I I know like it's it's a hugely popular game that me personally having played it a little bit, like I didn't get the appeal. I thought yeah, it, but I, I thought it was a good game, but I didn't fall in love with the, the way that many people have described. And uh, so I'm just it's like basically this is for the hardest of the hardcore Fez fan, which hardcore. I am not. And I, I I don't think actually it's it's all that I don't know. I mean I, I guess it's not all that surprising because the game is three years old. It's it's much beloved, of course. You know Phil Fish, uh, you know left in a big uh, fur in a big furor. Uh, after uh, you know, after after you know all this uh, this drama on social media, and the sequel got canceled, and you know he's out of game development now, and all that stuff. Yep, and yep. so I, I think that which makes it even more odd the, well, the sort of idea that that's the thing is that I, I think you know in a sense because because the game is so beloved by some people, and there's not anything else happening with it in regards to like a sequel or anything like that. This is the only sort of thing that can be done is to you know somehow find a way to resell that first game but really really dress it up and this is really really dressing up the first game you know giving it this this big grand on disc release special edition kind of thing but does i mean it just seems disproportionate with the the game and and the and the company surrounding you and and i but like but again that's because we didn't love the game i I mean you know like if there if if there were like a an incredible hardcover physical uh, edition like this like you know something literally like this but for ether one you and i would you know be talking about, like this is so fucking great like oh and it fits so perfectly with you know kind of the the aesthetic of the game and all that because we love that game so for us it would make sense that the game would be celebrated in this grand style i, I think the reason it doesn't make sense is because we're just not yeah but, but so uh, wait, wait. if you're gonna make that comparison <laughs> i want you to I want, if you're going to make the comparison, make it equal. So right. if you're going to use either one, we have to assume that, that James Burton, who's a listener of this show and a, a friend of the family here at uh, Outlaw Gamers, and his whole crew had this big brouhaha and said, fuck you to the games industry. <laughs> and, and then, hold on, wait, but wait, there's more. And then I said they were going to attach to this uh, Ether One amazing uh, boxed physical version, special edition, three years later, um, a book that has some sort of art work in it but they're not going to call it an art book and they're not going to show you what's inside yeah okay would, would you pay a hundred bucks for it yeah probably i guess i don't know i, I mean <laughs> I get what, not to i get what you're saying like i, I do just, and just to be clear white paper games is going nowhere they're working i hope they're working on a second game they haven't told us anything yet but um officially 
But I mean, still, but, uh, this is this is an industry as we've talked about in recent weeks. This is an industry built on people paying for things that they haven't seen yet. Um, so I don't know what you're talking about, and I did not pre-order Just Cause Three. So in in the in the larger scope of of game consumerism, is it all that ridiculous to expect that people will buy this without actually seeing what's inside the? It's not an art book. I'm curious. I'm curious to hear what our listeners uh, say about this. All right. So, uh, Brent, yeah. this, I think this is what your opening was referring yes, to. Yes, it might be. But this is an announcement from Techland, the makers of Dying Light, a game which I really, really enjoyed. Uh, I'm quite surprised that I enjoyed it as much as I did. I finished it, uh, one of the few open world games that I have finished. Uh, and, and I actually would have gone back as soon as I got back to the United States. I immediately re-downloaded it and was going to play it again and keep playing it because I liked it so much. My save game somehow, I don't know what I did, but it somehow got screwed up and I didn't want to start all over. So I haven't uh, continued to play the game. But they are releasing an expansion pack, uh, which was included uh, in their uh, season pass, mm-hmm. which was uh, $20 initially. Uh, this, the, um, uh, the expansion pack was going to run $15 uh, initially. And they have recently announced uh, the, the, uh, the expansion is called the following. They recently announced that they're actually going to raise the price of the DLC. And basically, Brent Techland said, you know, we, we basically got down to finishing it. The game is due out, uh, I, believe, I believe it's January or something like that. Um, uh, the expansion, excuse me. Uh, they got to the end of it and said essentially, like, this turned out to be way more content, way bigger than we anticipated. It could be a standalone thing, but we didn't want to, we would have to basically delay the, um, the launch date of it to do that. We don't want to do that. So we are going to raise the price because there's so much content. But uh, in, a, in an uh, awesomely surprising consumer-friendly move, Brent, they announced it uh, a, like sometime last week and said that through December 8th, they will, they will keep it at the price it was advertised at and the season pass will be at the price it's advertised at. And then on December 8th, they're going to raise uh, the prices to $20 and $30 respectively for the content and the season pass if you want the season pass. So uh, uh, it's an interesting... I, I don't believe I've seen this happen before, Brent, where they've announced a price of a piece of DLC and then actually raised it. Um, nor am I sure recent in recent memory of the games industry have I seen consumer-friendly behavior. I, I also uh, don't understand what's remotely consumer-friendly about this. Well, the I, fact I'm that still they confused didn't... about that. Well, the fact that they're, they're letting people know with enough time that if they're interested... Uh, you can still get it at the originally advertised price. I think that all they're being honest and upfront with the consumer, which I think is fair. I don't see I don't see any difference between that and the classic cognitive dissonance sales technique of saying tell people that they can get this thing at this low price, but it's a limited time, and if they don't buy it right now, then they're going to pay more. It's the exact same thing that fucking QVC and infomercials and every other uh, slightly shady salesman has done throughout history I, I don't see it as being any different at all that's interesting that's a that's a that's a cynical perspective that is not unfounded <laughs> at all i hadn't thought of it that way i mean do you, are you saying that you think they intended to do this all along i i, I or have, that when they I have no idea i have no idea but i do know i do know that telling somebody listen this is going to cost this much okay and you're like all right and so that's the price like yeah but if you buy it before this day it's only going to cost this much. I'm just saying there's nothing new about that whatsoever, and I, I don't think that it's all that consumer friendly. I mean, I guess it's I guess it's uh, it, it's great if uh, if you if you already pre ordered it or whatever, and they're not gonna like they're not actually asking you for additional money for it. But for you know for anybody else for for people who had not yet invested money in this, I don't think it's any different than than what I'm describing. Yeah, maybe not. I don't know. That's. I, I mean, I, I can't disagree with that necessarily. It did feel genuine. The wording, I feel like, it was a decision they they arrived at. Yeah. Um, at the end of the process, and and in doing so, said, okay, we're going to raise the price because we feel like this is worth more than we were originally asking, but we won't do it right away because we don't think that's fair. If I was going to be super super cynical about it, I would say that this is actually even a bit of salesmanship. Like th- that, this in and right, of that, itself. That maybe they did like, look. Like we got to the end of this thing and we were like, "My God, this is so fucking good that we actually have to charge more money for it." And you're like, "Oh, it's that good? Oh, I can't wait to have it now." You know, what I mean, like, like, like. I wonder if there's not even a little bit of it to that. When you read their stuff, they don't say. Uh, and it's interesting you said that because I was thinking the same thing. 
they don't actually say like it's so good that we feel like it's worth more money. Yeah. They they just say like it ended up being a lot more content and it took us a, a lot more time to develop than we initially intended. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I, I I wish them the best. Like honestly, like I, I'm. Not, it is a fun game. I don't I'm know if I'll buy it. Being cynical about their motives. I'm just being cynical about. I guess maybe the, the reaction world. to it a little bit. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. Um, all right, Brent. Last up, and I suppose we could have made this a clubhouse too, but I don't think what's, it's worthy. What's the um, point? <laughs> is uh, coming Thursday, December third, Brent, to every screen known to man. Yeah. Jeff Keeley's. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing yeah. as I'm saying it because I watched the video and he said, "Like last year, I took a big risk by putting on these game awards." Yeah. And I'm thinking, "Did you really? Did you? I don't think so." Uh, the Game Awards 2015. Unless he paid Brett. for the entire thing himself. I'm not sure how That's big right. the risk was. Uh, and maybe he did. I don't know. But uh, Game Awards 2015, the uh, the next in the series of the VGAs, Xs, and whatever. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be footage we know from Far Cry Primal, gameplay footage. Um, we know there's going to be gameplay footage from Quantum Break, which I did, was, was unaware until I saw this video actually includes live action footage in the game. Um, Brent, do it, it's coming, like I said, in a couple of days. It's Thursday this week. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be some awards I hear. Mm -hmm. Do you give a shit? You know, I, I want to. Um like every year, it's the same conversation. It, it, it is, and the 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 thing about it is that I don't know. Like I, I think that I can't sort of separate where, like the debacle that the VGAs was. Like I can't separate whose fault that kind of came down to. Like was it Spike? Was it, uh, you know, was it Viacom? Was it was it Jeff Keeley? I think that Jeff Keeley is probably in the position. Uh, he's better positioned than almost anyone to make some sort of relevant game awards show that does a good job of, of honoring the artists in this industry while also making it enough of a sort of populist event. I would love for somebody to find a formula that makes that work. Uh, because I, I think that, I think the game industry deserves it, and I think the people in the game industry deserve that. What I'm hearing and seeing thus far it seems a little too close to more of the same. So, I don't know. I, I mean, I want it to work, but I'm not sure if this is going to be the thing to do it. I, I kind of go into it every year with an amount of optimism that this is going to be the year that it's finally going to click and work. And, and it just seems like every year... It doesn't happen, but I, I never stop wanting for it to happen. And like I said, Keeley's, you know, Keeley's got a, a better shot than anyone of of succeeding here. And you know, for that reason alone, uh, I, I do wish him the best on this one thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, dude. I, you know, I, I agree with every single thing you just said. We go through this every year, and I think the reason, you know, I think the reason we talk about this every year as opposed to just ignoring it completely, is, and I, and I think this is probably representative of uh, all of the listeners of this show, I think we all feel like it would have tremendous value to us to have a meaningful, uh, or at least a more meaningful or professional um, uh, award show mm -hmm. for our piece of the industry. I mean, I think, I mean, I guess it's interesting, because as I say that, I'm thinking to myself, well, how meaningful are the Grammys and how meaningful are the Oscars? Really? And I and I think they're and I think they're. I mean, I guess the, right, right. To, and I to think the they're winners, kind of they're bullshit. really, really important. You know, well, they're certainly meaningful from a financial standpoint. Yeah. in the industry, yeah, but that's true. Um, but I do think it's it's. Uh, I personally sort of conceptually think it's ridiculous that we, you know, that that we sort. Of, I mean, you look at performances, for example, all the nominees. They're all usually um, absolutely just astounding, and so to call one better than the other. You know what I mean? Is a little bit silly, well, almost. Yeah, I, um, I mean that, that's you know, I mean that that's age old. I mean, you know, the whole artist competition thing, and it's why you know it's why they they did the whole thing. You know, that they they made the big switch to, and the Oscar goes to as opposed to the winner is, and you know all that stuff. So right, yeah, but but uh, there is something that feels uh, uh, like it would it would sort of be meaningful for us to have something that is uh, I don't know what the word is, but it's professional, respectable, yeah. legitimate. Uh, as as the other forms of entertainment, and these do not feel like it, yet they're the only things out there representing us in this 
um, in this way. And so, you know, the thing is, there there have been moments that that have been meaningful, like the moment where Michael Chiklis came out half baked at the uh, at, at the VGAs. Not knowing his lines, not really giving a shit while he was there, just to like, hey, there's a free bar and a party, and I'm going to it, and video game, blah blah blah, something or other, you know, like, I, and I love Chicky, like I, I, I really do, like I respect him as an artist, and I, and I, I love, uh, I, I love his work, but I mean, he he was not there for any other reason than somebody paid for him to be there and paid for him to eat and drink for free, and he got to hang out with people or whatever, like, like I don't think he got any interest whatsoever in video gaming beyond that. And like, like that, that bugs me. Like, like it, it, it bugs me that they were trying to kind of force this whole, like, uh, I don't know, like the sort of like, you know, popular culture hype train to sort of infuse with it. But having said that, the, uh, the year that red dead won game of the year and the developers from rockstar San Diego and, uh, you know, got to go up on stage and, got to talk about you know making the game like seeing like kind of having that validation like having played that game loved it so much and seeing the people who seeing the people who made the game being recognized for the extraordinary the extraordinary art that they had created seeing jose gonzalez uh you know performing so far away live you know that that definitely was a cool experience it just agree, happened yeah. in and around a bunch of other things that were kind of lame. Ridiculous. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe one day we will get lucky and there will be a show. Maybe it will be this year. I have no doubt that I will watch it or watch clips of it with the hopes. I think a, a lot of us would like to see something that is more professional, respectable, or nothing at all <laughs> one of the you know what i mean like right. one of the two and so <laughs> it's like uh, superman's it's, cod piece either he has a big one or nothing at all <laughs> and it's time to hit the road brent you're going to start us off we only have two games this week yeah uh because you and i have been very focused focused gamers <laughs> i have uh, been for some time now uh, I was also out of town Wednesday through Sunday. That explains a lot. Um, uh, so, Brent, why don't you start us off with a little bit more Metal Gear Solid Five? Okay, I will. Uh, I will be happy to talk about Metal Gear Solid Five again. Did some live streaming over the weekend, and thanks everybody nice. who uh, who showed up. It was an impromptu thing. I didn't make any big to do about it, but uh, but nonetheless, some of the OGs came by, and uh, we, we hung out while I was playing uh, some Metal Gear Solid Five. I've also got a new Let's Play on YouTube, which is linked in the document, and you can go check out. The, the name of the game this past week is No Traces, right? I was talking last week about this whole thing I did with Mission 9, and, you know, like, all extractions and no rocket launchers, and I, I basically just, you know, kind of, I was playing a game with myself to, to challenge myself and see if Hey-o. I could do this. Ha ha! And so in the process of in the process of kind of researching some of the things that I was doing and reading, I came across a reference to the no traces bonus. And I went and did some reading about it, and it is my new favorite thing about Metal Gear Solid. You remember how we were talking about the, the onion layers, you know, how yep. the, you just keep peeling back things and there's more and more stuff to be mined. And this is the latest thing. So basically, this is what the no traces bonus is. You know, in the game you've got the uh, you've got the perfect stealth no kills bonus. If you don't get spotted, no reflex modes, no combat alerts, and you don't kill anybody, you get that bonus. The no traces bonus is the insane, it's the insane line in the sand way out beyond that one. And here is what it comes down to. Basically, you cannot use any weapons. You cannot use close quarters combat. You cannot throw empty magazines or use uh, decoys to divert guards. You cannot pull the trigger button on any weapon, secondary, primary, or support, you can only go into the level, you can use the Fulton, you, can, you can't use helicopter strikes, you can't use, or, or airstrikes, you can't, you can't have your buddies attack targets for you. You have to go in, accomplish the objective, and leave without breaking stealth, no reflex modes, no combat alerts, and without using without using any weapons. And it is, it's remarkable. It's remarkable the way that it changes your strategy, or at least the way that it changed my strategy. 
So I've the thing is I've played around with this. Like I've played around with the idea of like, oh, I'll get into this compound and I'll go and I'll get the prisoner and I won't knock out any guards or I won't, you know, trank any guards and then fall to the mat or anything like that. I've I've messed around with stuff like that, but I've done things like toss a magazine case to get the guy, you know, walking to walk one walking way, over that yeah. way when I need to get past him and things and, and that Okay, but that would be leaving a trace behind. Hey, where'd this empty magazine case for an American weapon come from? You know, that kind of thing. Right. So philosophically, that's what's going on. Well, wait, wait, let, me, let me stop and ask you something. Can you Fulton somebody? Like, can you sneak up behind someone and Fulton them? Don't think, I don't think you have the chance because... Because you mentioned that you, when, it, when, when you, you sneak were up behind you somebody, somebody you, it gives you the close quarter combat option. It doesn't right, give yeah, you the option right. of Fulton them. So you have, to, you have to incapacitate them first. And here's what you can do. Which you said you can't do, right? Well, uh, no, that's not what I said. What I said was you can't pull the trigger on a weapon. But Oh, so you can. But you can hold you can. them up because that doesn't involve pulling the trigger. You just go up behind them and you, know, you raise the weapon... So you can you can do a stick up and then Fulton them, but they're going to yell and scream because you haven't tranquilized them. So you have to, you know, you just have to be judicious about it. You have to make sure there's not anybody in close proximity that's going to hear that. <laughs> so, uh, wow, that's crazy. Man. And the other thing about it is, you, you know how like sometimes, well, I don't know. I mean, because you didn't play the fucking game, but uh, I played it for seven hours. But, yeah, okay. Like if you go up and you try to, you, you try to uh, stick somebody up come up behind them, you raise your gun. They don't always give up right away. You know, so, like sometimes the, the little triangle will turn blue, in which case they give up, they put down their gun, but a lot of times it'll stay red and they'll kind of act like they're putting down their gun and then they'll turn around and slash at you with your knife. Okay. That triggers reflex mode, breaks your no traces run, breaks your perfect stealth, no kills run. But if you turn off reflex mode, so that it, it, you don't even have it as an option. They slash at you. It never goes to reflex mode, obviously. They just turn around, they slash at you, and if you anticipate it, you back up so that they don't hit you, and then immediately move back into the two-meter radius, and then once they've had that attempt, then they give up. So if you turn off no reflexes, it, you know, it, it opens up like you know, a new, mm -hmm. a, a new right. scenario that you can, you can yeah. kind of work with. Yeah. So anyway, that's interesting. Huh. I did a uh, I did a no trace. Okay. Now here's the thing, though. Like everything, easy to do no traces if all you're doing is the main objective. Doing no traces and doing all the objectives not so easy. And so I did a a no traces all tasks S rank playthrough of episode ten. Uh, I actually did that on Twitch. Like that was what I was doing on Twitch. I, I had to go at it and and I managed to pull it off on the live stream. And then I went back uh, later and recorded myself doing it and kind of explained my methodology, like, you know, why I was doing what I was doing. And, and I, that's what's on YouTube right now. So if you want to check out episode 10, no traces, all tasks, go give it a look. See, it's, it's fun stuff. I mean, it's that's awesome. ridiculously fun. <laughs> that's awesome. So what about you? Uh, sir, it has been all battlefront all the time for yep. me. Um, as I alluded to, I talked about battlefront last week. Uh, I did have a little bit of a back and forth with some, uh, of the listeners on the show about amount of content, and, and it was based on, I think, something I had said on last week's show, and so I wanted to clarify a little bit, Brent, um, sort of what I was talking about. Um, but well, I'll start with that. So, so I made a comment last week about how I, I uh, had a bone to pick with um, people who are discussing the game, and, and, and particularly professional critics, because I do hold them to a different standard. Yeah. I do have an expectation of uh, being informed when, when doing things like writing reviews, and I, and I, and I uh, was struggling with a, people, a lot of people talking about how this game has uh, significantly less content and, and people are really upset about the $50 DLC mm -hmm. uh, season pass and everything. And I compared it to, I, and what I had said was, or what I had attempted to say, and I'm going to try and make it a little clearer, was that I totally get it if people think the game doesn't have enough content because they played all the previous uh, Battlefront games and this doesn't have what they want relative to those, or they just simply think it's not enough content. Uh, likewise with the $50 uh, season pass. If you think fifty bucks is too much for what they're uh, offering, and they've not they've detailed what they're offering in the amount of content, but not specifically like what planets and so forth. If you think fifty dollars is is too much for that, I have no problem with that. W what what I've been taking issue with is that again, particularly professional reviewers, uh, I feel like everybody's acting like it's it's this ridiculous amount of content. It's never happened before. And what I was trying to say was that you take this developer Dice and EA. 
uh, and you compare it to Battlefield 3 and Battlefield 4, um, and uh, even other FPS games out there like Call of Duty or Titanfall, it is uh, has as much or more content than some of those games. And, and the games that did have more, had more at launch or have more over the lifespan of the game, it's not significantly more. And so what I don't understand is um, if there's so little, is why I don't, it's not that I don't understand why we're upset about $50 season passes or why we're upset about not enough content. I don't understand why the conversation doesn't include uh, if this is the way it was with Battlefield 3, this is the way it was with Battlefield 4, and we don't like this. Yeah. It seems like people are talking about it as if Battlefront is the first game to, first and only game to ever have this much content or to sell seasons pass for this much money, and it's simply not true. Right. Um, and so I went back and forth a little bit, like I said, with Aaron B. and Rowan. Very uh, good-natured. It's a healthy discussion, I think, is, is uh, always important and always welcome on our website. Yeah. Um, and so I finally got to the point where I actually went and did math, Brent. <laughs> and, uh, Everybody because, stand back. <laughs> because, not the, because it wasn't it, like my point just wasn't crossing over. And, and sort of, here's how it shook out. So the idea was you know, that there's so little content and, and, and the DLC is too much. So basically, um, I, I went and compared Battlefield 3 at launch, Battlefield 4 at launch, Titanfall at launch, uh, and Battlefront at launch, and then looked at what they were over the lifespan relative vis-a-vis the maps, specifically the maps and the modes, the amount of modes to play. And um, ba- I, I started using the term multiplayer experiences. It's what Battlefield 3, uh, it's what DICE used to describe these, this in Battlefield 3, mm-hmm. which means essentially like if there's five maps and ten modes, there's 50, and, and t- all 10 modes can be played on all five maps. There's 50 possible different multiplayer experiences. Does that make yeah. sense? So there's five maps, 10 modes. All the modes that can be played on all the maps, you get 50 potentially different mode map combinations. Okay. So, uh, so I went and figured out, like, Battlefield 3, for example, had 45 potential mode map combinations at launch. Right. Um, Battlefront has 55 potential mode map combinations at launch. It, with it, it, with the addition of the Battle of Jakku, which comes out two weeks after launch, mm-hmm. uh, it becomes 65. So again, Battlefield 3 had 45 possible mode map combinations at launch. Battlefront has 65 possible mode map combinations at launch, a full 20 more than Battlefield 3. Battlefield 4 uh, had 70, so it did ha- does have more than Battlefront, but only by 5. And Battlefield, and excuse me, Titanfall... Um, uh, which of all the games is the only one that has no single player offering at all? Um, Titanfall came out with seventy five mode map combinations okay. at launch. So just to give you an idea, so we now know that the season pass is going to have it's going to have four content packs that include each four new maps, uh, a new game mode, a new hero, uh, and then new star cards and that sort of thing. So uh, while we don't know yet exactly like when there's a new game mode is it going to be applied to how many different maps or whatever but that's essentially the exact same plan that battlefield 3 and battlefield 4 used in their season pass each map pack had four new maps um, usually a new mode uh, and often those modes were only applied to uh for just the four maps that came with it but but it's right in line with battlefield 3 and battlefield 4 battlefront is and so i just wanted to be clear about what i was saying was was just that uh, the amount of content in terms of maps and modes is roughly the same. It's broken up differently. Right. It looks differently. So in Battlefront, Battlefield 3, it was something like, yes, there were, there, were five, there were 10 maps and five modes, and all the modes were available on all of the maps. Whereas in Battlefront, it's not like that. Yeah. There's more, more maps and more modes, and there, some of them are only available on six maps, and some are available on nine. Some are only available on four. And so The actual but, numbers... But, the actual like multiplayer experiences, the different modes, and I think one of the things with Battlefront is that people, and this is a design flaw on the part of Battlefront, people uh, think that the only good modes are, are Walker Assault and maybe Supremacy, the big modes, and they're not incentivized unless you're playing the challenges, which is what I do, um, to play these other modes. But the truth is, all of the modes are good. With uh, The only one I don't like is Hero Hunt, but the rest of them, there's there were... Uh, nine modes at launch, and they were all, I played them all, including Fighter Squadron, which is flying the, the aircraft, which is something I would never play. Um, but I made a discovery this week, Brent, that is very exciting, which is when you're playing on the PC, I can just pick up my controller, that my wired controller that's plugged in, mm-hmm. in the middle of any match. I could be in the middle of a Supremacy or Walker Assault match and start flying using the controller. And then when I die, I just go back to the keyboard. That's a, that is good. Uh, 
it's changed everything because flying with the controller is remarkably uh, more natural than it is with the keyboard, and it's actually fun and exciting. And so I've started picking up vehicle pickups now um, in the game, which I hadn't done for the first 10 or 12 hours that I played it. Um, and so I think a lot of people aren't playing, like they only want to play one map type, and Supremacy and Walker Assault at this point only have four maps each. And I think people feel frustrated because it doesn't seem like it's that many. But I, if you play all the other modes and sprinkle them in there, um, I, I think it's a, it's, it's, I'm having just tons of fun with the game. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. There are things that need to be fixed. The, the walkers and walker assault need to be balanced. There do need to be more modes. I, I'm pretty sure that when they release the Battle of Jakku, there's two more maps with the Battle of Jakku that's going to have one large-scale map and one, one smaller-scale map for games like uh, um, Droid Run and Drop Zone. The large-scale map, I assume, is going to have walker assault and supremacy on it, as well as a new mode they're introducing in, in the DLC for Battlefront called Turning Point, which is somewhat akin to Rush in the Battlefield series, um, only a little bit different. So Turning Point is uh, the Rebels are attacking the Empire. You start off with three points that you have to conquer. You have to conquer one of the three points. Uh, when you start capturing one point, uh, it never resets again. So if you capture 25% of that point, and then everyone dies there, it doesn't reset. The Empire can't take it over again. It stays at 25. And so, but you only need to capture one point, and then it moves on to the next set of three points. And so the Empire is forced to figure out like which point. They have to defend all three points, basically. Um, so a new, a, and it's a large 20v20 game mode. Right. So it'll be a third large game mode. Um, so, so what I've been doing, Brent, uh, that I, that's caused me to really enjoy the game is I've been playing to my challenges. There's these three challenges you have at any one time, like get 15 kills with the ATST, or take out 15 snow speeders, or get 25 headshots with a heavy blaster rifle. And if you play those, they cause you to play different modes, because some of them, for example, capture 25 droids can only be accomplished in droid run, or capture 25 pods can only be accomplished in drop zone. And so it actually causes you to play different modes, and it makes the game infinitely more fun. Um, so the, the one thing that, it, and it's sort of by design that you can't do this. One thing that I think would benefit Battlefront tremendously is if there was a, um, variety mode where you could hit, you know, variety and not only would the map cycle, but the modes would cycle. Yeah. So you, you um, just like go into variety mode, play for two hours and you'd get a sampling of, you know, right. of everything. The problem is the way they designed the game, um, uh, Supremacy and Walker Assault or 20 V 20, um, Droid Run, I believe is uh 6v6 there's modes that are 10v10 mm. modes that are 6v6 modes that are uh i think there's even a mode that's 4v4 yeah. uh the the so it gets a little complicated with regards to that it's a solvable problem um and i think it would benefit the game uh tremendously were they to do that but you can also take it upon the one the the one thing that's uh the saving grace of not having that load times in in battlefront are the best i've seen uh, in any multiplayer video game of this type. And so to jump out of uh, Supremacy and jump into Droid Run is a very fast thing to do, and uh, and and I people should. I, I really, uh, so far, I'm loving uh, uh, Walker Assault, Supremacy. I love Droid Run. I love Drop Zone. I enjoy Fighter Squadron every now and then. Um, Heroes vs. Villains can be a lot of fun. Cargo, which is Capture the Flag, is is fun. Uh, I'm looking forward to this new turning point mode. And again, there's going to be four new modes and 16 new maps with the DLC should you choose to partake in it. So uh, I'm having a lot of fun with it, man. I think about it when I'm not playing it. I missed it when I was out of town for the weekend. I played it as soon as I got back. Um, I get killed a lot. I kill a lot. Uh, the star cards add a lot. Um, I, the blasters are tons of fun and play very differently. I'm really, really enjoying it. And it's it's just it's a great it's a fun, fun gaming experience, uh, and it's a great Star Wars experience, and and uh, yeah, I'm still having a great time with it, man. Cool, man. Yeah, that's all that counts. That is all right. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and ride along into the sunset. Since you got the mic, why don't you go ahead and keep it and uh, tell us what your into the sunset is this week? Yeah, man. There's so there's not uh, like a new news story to go with this or anything. It's it's older news, but I just wanted to remind people that the Uncharted Four multiplayer beta uh, starts this week, December fourth. Uh, Friday, December 4th, mm -hmm. and runs through the 13th. So for nine days, for those of you that own the Nathan Drake collection, which is myself included, uh, the multiplayer beta for Uncharted 4 starts this Friday. I look forward to 
checking it out over the weekend and talking about it next week. I'm excited to jump into the world. Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, for my own part, the end of the sunset this week is going to be a story by Patricia Hernandez on Kotaku talking about how Fallout 4 and Skyrim might occupy the same universe. And there's a very interesting there's a very interesting revelation that comes about in Fallout 4, which is essentially the discovery of Nern Root, which of course, if you played Skyrim, is the is the like the the glowing leafy thing that you have to collect that uh, that that uh, that kind of sings, like you know, it, it makes this uh, this sort of uh, humming sound when you get close to it. So anyway, uh, this article details. Uh, something that you can discover aboard the airship commanded by the Brotherhood of Steel, which looks an awful lot like Nernroot. It's this experimental plant, and it can heal you. But if you go into the, um, if you go into the, the there's like a, uh, there's like a lore, you know, the lore for it. It uh, it describes this really interesting uh, process of experimentation. Uh, discovering this route and then uh, and then trying different things with it and discovering these properties, uh, discovering it makes a really really good tea and it's got restorative capabilities, uh, but maybe also addictive uh, qualities. But it's just it's a really interesting little read through. But the tantalizing thing that, that they end with is that it implies that that Fallout is actually set before Skyrim. That as opposed to you know as opposed to thinking that Skyrim is some you know ancient Hyborian age, you know, kind of like Conan or the Middle Earth trilogy that is that is now lost to history, you know, many, many uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago or something like that, that the idea is that uh, that Skyrim is actually our distant future, like a Planet of the Apes sort of scenario where the Earth has has, you know, completely been, uh, you know, eradicated civilization wiped from the map and that a new primitive civilization grew up and basically started all over again. And that's what resulted in in the world of the Elder Scrolls. So anyway, um, it's a cool little article. I'm not playing Fallout 4, so I can't go check this out myself. But if you are a fan of Skyrim and you are playing Fallout 4, it might be a, an Easter egg you want to look in on. Just a, a cool little tidbit. That is absolutely freaking awesome. Indeed. So, uh, all right. Uh, our ride along this week, Brent, comes from the world famous Tokyo Choo Choo. Tokyo says, my ride-along is to highlight the BS situation surrounding Yakuza 5. Sega released Yakuza 1 through 4 in the West before suddenly decided to shut the door on the Western audience. Fans like myself have been waiting for five years to play a translated version of Yakuza 5. Finally, under pressure from Sony, Sega announced that the English translation of the game would be released digitally in 2015. Yay! I pre-ordered. The pre-order is still good until December 31st, 2015. It's now almost December, and the game still isn't out despite over a year in translation hell in october sega told us the game was coming out in mid-november but shortly after they quietly deleted any trace of said announcement what? the clock yeah, the clock is ticking what happens if the pre-order date comes and no goes shit. do we get refunds what's going on there's no news no transparency nothing the lack of effort displayed by sega on this front is very disappointing yeah no no kidding that's uh <laughs> that's not bullshit that's, yes i think bullshit. bullshit is a yeah <laughs> i agree and tokyo if the game is not out by december 31st brent and i have decided that we are going to start the tokyo choo-choo defense fund yes and we're going to sue sega on your behalf for emotional damage and shenanigans and shenanigans on the basis of shenanigans on the basis yeah, of emotional does- damage and shenanigans I, uh, I, of course, I was not aware of this, but this just reading this uh, is infuriating yes, to it me. Is. It sounds like absolute bullshit, and it goes if back you, to If the- you've taken people's money, and now it looks, I mean, like, this is like, uh, this, is, this is like going into a coffee shop where coffee is $60 a, a, a cup, which is to say Starbucks, and you go in, and you, you order, you pay for the coffee, and they never call your name. And you make the mistake of walking outside because you got better cell signal out there, and then they close and lock the door behind you and close business forever. I mean, and take down the sign, yeah. and <laughs> like nothing's in the windows anymore. That's right. And like as you're knocking on the door, like they bulldoze the building. I mean, like it's it's a little bit like that. Maybe not, but uh, that is uh, that that is a frustrating situation, no doubt. Yeah, that's it is bullshit. And Tokyo, our uh, our empathy goes out with you. Uh, for sure, that's, that's absolute bullshit. And keep, speaks keep to us, keep sort us of updated of, on that. 
Yeah, please do. It, it, it does highlight some one of the larger issues that we have in gaming industry, which is the lack of transparency, selling shit that you don't have, and you know delays and. Yeah. Uh, it's that's just super frustrating. Yes, uh, Brent. With that, I think we're going to call it a show. We've reached the end of yet another episode. As usual, we want to hear what the listeners have to say about everything we talked about today. Whether it's uh, Tokyo Choo Choo's righteous indignation, uh, Fallout Four and Skyrim, maybe being in the same universe, the Uncharted Four multiplayer beta, Star Wars Battlefront, Metal Gear Solid Five, the Game Awards of 2015, Dying Lights, upcoming expansion, the following uh, from Techland Fez, getting a hundred dollar physical limited edition release three years after its initial release. Uh, the patent on loading screen minigames going away. Let's hear what you think about that. Uh, the video that we put up in the top of the show of Star Wars Battlefront versus Return of the Jedi. And likewise, uh, the confirmation that Sony is releasing a remote play app for Windows and Mac to use with the PS4. We want to hear your thoughts on any of that or any other gaming-related topics. We appreciate your part in the conversation. As usual, he is Brent Adams. I am Lauren Baumgarten. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing.